typically it's been documented, easily shared, easily communicated. You have someone maybe in a training organization that is an expert, they're helping train others. That's great, we're not worried about that. What keeps us awake at night is the other type of knowledge. Tacit knowledge is all that stuff that lives between someone's ears, but they're not sharing it. <laughs> so that's a real challenge for us, is what do you do with that institutional knowledge? How do you try to train someone on how to fit into the culture? That's rarely written down, right? But what does good teamwork look like in this department? So typically it's very hard to formalize. It's difficult to even verbalize. Um, very situation specific, very contextual. Oftentimes we like to call this the type of knowledge such as how to ride a bike. If I hand you a checklist of five things you should do in order to learn how to ride a bike and you had never done it before, could you do it for the first time? Not necessarily, right? How many of you think you'd probably fall over, <laughs> right? Most of us would because riding a bike, it requires some practice, some experience, right, to kind of get a feel for it, get your balance. So this how to ride a bike knowledge is challenging because even if we sat down with that expert, we had it for an hour and we put together 10 steps to do this process. It wouldn't be enough to be successful at it because there's something they've learned through time and experience and usually painful lessons that help them get really good at that skill. So again, we call that tacit knowledge where it's hard to verbalize, it's not formal, it certainly isn't written down anywhere. So that's the kind that we really focus our process on. So for us, we have all kinds of repositories for this Explicit knowledge. Anyone else using SharePoint? Anyone else have that? So a few of you do. Um, are you using SharePoint today for knowledge capture, knowledge sharing in some way? Yeah, Seeing some heads nodding. How are you using it over here? It's uh, it's serving as sort of like the repository for our training manuals, our SOPs, or just a lot of training uh, standard documentation. Awesome. That's I mean, a lot of other stuff, but for our group, that's all kind of Great. Terrific. And it's searchable, so anyone can find what it they're looking searchable. for. That's I, the, I think that's, that's the best feature of SharePoint. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, any other examples? Do you, are you using it as well? Same? Same? Yeah. All right. So training documentation, SOPs. Great. Right. Anyone else using uh, SharePoint? Anyone else need a copy of the uh, handout for today? We got it. Can you help me pass this back? There you go. All right, so SharePoint's a good tool. Um, we have, like you, we have training documentation, standard operating procedures up there. Uh, the challenge is oftentimes these sites get built and then nobody manages them. They kind of become the wild, wild west. And pretty soon you search for an item and you get six versions or six different <laughs> flavors of it. So it's really difficult to sometimes find what you're looking for if there's a lot of documentation there. Um, so one thing that we're focused on this year is cleaning up a lot of these older documents that just aren't the latest. So that's a really uh, worthwhile effort. Not very sexy, but it's worthwhile. Uh, so SharePoint's a good tool for that. The other reason we like SharePoint is that anybody can post stuff there. You don't have to be a web person or an IT person to use it. So it's kind of a democratic tool. Anybody can put information up there if they have permission. Um, usually these are managed at the local level. So each department has their own SharePoint site. Uh, anyone that wants access is given access and they can post documents there. So it's a good, a good tool. Again, the biggest challenge we have is kind of curating all that information. How's the audio there? Is that good? It's for my camera. Oh, for the camera, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, sounds like All right, cool. Um, anyone used uh, EDM before, electronic document management system? <coughs> so we basically scan a lot of hard copy documents in here. It has optical character recognition, OCR, built into it. So if you have things that people are signing, right? So signing sheets for training or other documentation that starts off in hard copy form, OJT logs if you have on-the-job training. Um, that all gets scanned into EDM, and it's searchable, right? So all these PDFs become searchable documents, so it's not just things that were created in electronic form, but it, you can also then scan and track all the hard copy stuff. So all of our signed contracts live in EDM, all of our kind of official documents live in EDM. Um, so again, that's, that's one resource for you. Uh, anyone else have shared drives, just specific to your department? Right, so a lot of us do. That's another tool. How many of you find that that is very well organized? Okay, I'm not seeing a ton of hands. <laughs> is it the wild, wild west? Yeah. Right? 
everything and anything. I mean, you have like birthday pictures and you know all kinds of you know pictures of cats, <laughs> random stuff in there, right? So sometimes that's hard to find what you're looking for. The big reason that we're pushing people to not use shared drives is it's not easily accessible by others, where SharePoint is. So we want it to be universally accessible so that someone in a totally different department can find a resource in your area. Uh, how many of you already are capturing process maps? Have anyone doing that? OK, uh, what are some examples of what you're using uh, those for? I'm kind of imagining like flow, kind of like, uh, they, they tend to reside, or I guess, be paired with our, our SOP documentation. So there's right. that, that's in our group, I guess, maybe not the whole agency. That's, that tends to be the approach. Great, and excellent. And what are some examples of processes that you've kind of mapped out there? I mean, like with our SOPs, we've been working on some of just our, we're, we're kind of a field group, uh, okay. and, and a lot of our field tasks uh, and the protocols that we employ to kind of maintain our QA, QC uh, high for, for our data capture uh, is, is included with our SOPs and our training documentation. I mean, Great. it's accessible for other folks, but Good. right now, primarily, that's that's the use for, for process maps. Good. That's a really good best practice. So it's not just the training on the how-to, but also what's the overall process look like, right? And we're, I might have others. certain steps that are really detailed and in-depth, but I need to know the big picture here, right? Right, right. <laughs> so that's a really good practice. Um, so one thing that we're doing is trying to standardize our process maps. Uh, my colleague and I, this last year, interviewed a bunch of different <laughs> departments to try and look at, okay, what does your process documentation look like today? <laughs> Uh, how much consistency do you think we found? <laughs> Not much, right? It was interesting. We had uh, some people were using the traditional kind of here to here kind of flow. Some people were adding the little decision points, right? The yes, no points, and then kind of branching off depending on if it's yes or no. And then we had some people using the swim lane approach, right? Where you have all the different people that could be involved in this process, you have department A, department B, someone else. So all the different people that touch that process. And then you basically move it from left to right. And you can see, OK, for step one, it's handled up here. Step two, it goes down here. Step three, down there. So that's the swim lane, swim lane approach. So we finally got an agreement across all these departments to stick to one format going forward. So any of our new process maps are going to adopt to this uh, standard. And that's really useful in terms of sharing information across the organization. Right now we're in the middle of a, pro a couple of projects. One is called the 100 Day Project Effort. And it's really a process improvement initiative. We're trying to look at processes that cut across different departments and business units. How do we improve them and streamline them? It's very hard to do those types of projects when people show up at the table with six different process <laughs> map uh, formats. So, this is really going to be a, a good thing for us. So again, we've got process maps, and then I assume all of you have training material. So again, there's lot, no shortage of explicit knowledge repositories. But for CAS and knowledge, in most organizations, and this is where we were, there was nothing really available. So if a manager knew that you know, so-and-so is going to be retiring in two months, or three months, or four months, we really didn't have anything to offer them to say, hey, we'll come in and help you capture all that stuff that you know lives in their head that they haven't shared, with, shared yet with anyone. So for us, we decided that it'd be worthwhile to build a knowledge capture toolkit to really help with capturing all this know-how that was just kind of tracked in this person's head. So this is how we borrowed a definition of this from Accenture. So I think you have some version of this in your handout. So knowledge management is bigger than a tool. It's bigger than a software. It's really a discipline. It helps us acquire, share, and leverage knowledge. And this is really important for us to think about. It's not just the capture, right? We have to then share it and leverage it. It was really a waste of time if all we did is sit down and interview somebody and nobody looked at those notes, right? So for us, it's really important to think holistically about not just sitting down, capturing what we can, but also how do you share it and how do you leverage it. We talked about SharePoint earlier. For us, that's a big part of how we share that information out. So if we sit down and do a knowledge mm -hmm. capture interview, one of the first things we do is post that on SharePoint so that other people can quickly find what they're looking for. So process, capture it, store it, share it, and apply it. And for us, again, we really didn't have anything in place to do hardly any of this stuff. I think the application is still a challenge. So getting people to go back and look at that documentation you create. An interesting question comes up about when should we harvest 
At most organizations, when do we think about knowledge capture in that person's life cycle? Right at the end, right? <laughs> they got one foot out the door, they're leaving in a month, they're leaving in two weeks, and now we're panicked. We're like, man, what are we going to do? This person has so much know-how, and we haven't captured any of it. So usually we're in crisis mode. So that's where we have typically been as well. So we kind of think about the expert, or the exit rather, most often. But there's a couple other places to think about when you might go through knowledge capture. If you, instead of having a fire drill in panic mode just before they, have, they step out the door, what if we thought about instead, okay, once you have been kind of designated as subject matter expert in your area, automatically we'll include you in our knowledge capture process. That's something we're working on is getting ahead of the curve rather than always waiting until the very last second to do something about it. And then what if, how, how cool would this be if instead of waiting for even that to happen when they walk in the door, we hired them for some reason, right? They are usually coming in with some specialized skill or know-how. And ideally, it's to complement what we already have, not duplicate that. So what if we had an entry process when we bring in someone, especially in a real specialized area, maybe it's very technical or that we know we're getting something really special with this individual. What if at that point, we walk them through a knowledge capture process? So it kind of flips it on its head where instead of just worrying about the fire drill as they have one foot out the door, we think a little bit more strategically about how do we get ahead of this? So we're not in panic mode when they give us their you know, two weeks notice. So that's something to think about. We're not totally there yet. I'd say we're still somewhere between uh, these, two, these two boxes on the right-hand side. We'd like to get to the left. All right, so what I want to do today, this is meant to be a workshop. So I'm going to share with you the approach that we came up with for knowledge capture. And then I've got a few activities built in throughout the session, so it's not just me yakking at you. So we're going to be working in small groups. I'm going to have you think about some of the tools that I'm going to share with you. Is there anything here that you find useful? Anything you can see applying to your company? And uh, also add to this. I'm not suggesting by any means that this is the end-all, be-all, but it's a starting point. So in our small group activities I have planned, please share uh, what else are you doing to either uh, on any of these elements to capture uh, know-how for, for experts. That's the uh, planned approach. So back in 2009, I was tasked with establishing a process for knowledge <laughs> capture at, at my organization. So the first thing we decided to do is do a little homework, do some research on today what's happening, not just inside the organization, but also outside. So for step one, we actually contracted with a consulting firm called CPS HR Consulting, and they helped us with that research phase. And that was important because they really had expertise at a national level. They do this type of thing with lots of different organizations. They specialize in the public sector, in the nonprofit sector. So we felt like they really understood us as a public municipality. So that was a, an important starting point. I'll go into more detail on that in a moment. Um, we then went into developing the toolkit itself. We got some recommendations from that consultant. We got a nice thick report out of that. And then the challenge was, okay, out of all the stuff that they looked at and all of the things that they kind of recommended, what do we want to do? What can we act on? And is there something kind of practical that we can bring back to the organization? So that wasn't included in their report. That was kind of a recommended next step. Now go figure this out. <laughs> so at that point, it was kind of back on, on my desk to kind of work with a team to develop that. And I'll talk more about those steps in a moment. Um, for us, we felt it was important that it not just be uh, an initiative coming strictly out of the HR area, but also that we get executives behind it. So we worked hard to make sure we could get executive sponsorship so that at the end of the day, this would roll out via the executive for each and every line of business. So we have power generation, we have grid assets, we have an administrative type group. We wanted the communication around this not to come from HR, but rather to come from the senior leader for every single line of business. So it really was kind of develop some ownership. At the end of the day, if my boss's boss says, hey, this is important, it's a very different message from someone in corporate <laughs> saying, okay, now go do this. So we thought that was an important step. And then finally, the company-wide rollout, I'll share with you some of the things we did there to kind of get this, get this tool used. <coughs> so the first step we did is to do a little re research. On the internal side, we wanted to find out what are people doing, what's working, what are some of the challenges. So I worked with this consultant to identify who should we be talking to, what are some questions we should be asking them, and then the consultant kind of summarized all, this, all these interviews for us. Um, it was interesting, we didn't expect to find much consistency, and sure enough, we didn't. 
so there was kind of all over the board. We had areas that were doing absolutely nothing. We had areas that were kind of put dabbling in it a little bit with their toe. And we had one or two groups that were a little bit ahead of the curve. So part of our objective for this was to try to uncover, are there any best practices inside the organization before we go looking outside the organization? And for us, that was, that was important. When we roll out the solution, if we could say, hey, you know what? <coughs> Janet's been using it a long time. It's, using, it's been working well in their area. And they happen to know Janet. That's a good thing. It gives us some credibility so it's not just coming from outside the organization. Any of you work at companies where it helps if the solution is homegrown? Anyone have that <laughs> kind of mindset? So for us, that was important that it not be viewed as an entirely foreign thing that the company is trying to adopt, but include some elements that were a little bit more homegrown. So that was an important uh, first step. This took a while. This was about a six month effort to interview probably 40 people across six or seven different business units, compile all of that, and put that into a nice report. And again, the, the consultant did most of that work. I was kind of sitting in, observing the uh, interviews, and kind of uh, as a fly on the wall. So the in internal research was important. The challenge was we didn't uncover a whole lot of best practices. We had one or two <coughs> little nuggets. So we thought, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. One example of something on the inside, we had a little users group for kind of uh, advanced analysis software, um, business objects explorer, and a couple other um, kind of specialized software tools. This user community was kind of homegrown. They just kind of reached out to each other and started meeting about once every month or two. And one thing they did with SharePoint is they found out that it had a feature that no one else was using, and that was a wiki. So you've all used Wikipedia, right? So you can go in there. If you don't like the facts of history, you can change it to suit your own. No, you can, <laughs> you, know, you can edit that, right? You can add to it, keep it up to date. So it's kind of a cool concept. And what they had done is use this wiki tool in SharePoint that was a mystery to everyone else. And they were actually using that to share information about how you would use a couple of these very, very specialized software tools. Probably 20 people across the organization were using these very, very specialized kind of heavy duty big data analytics type uh, software. So they were using that. And the interesting thing about their wiki was it was kind of messy. It wasn't pretty, but it did the job. So they would do kind of quick screen captures, add a couple notes, kind of throw together these little homegrown job aids. But it was a great resource for that little community of about 20, 30 people in terms of, well, I'm stuck at this part of the process. Now what do I do in terms of using that tool? That was one kind of cool internal thing that we discovered. And there were a couple others like that that we thought we could share on. Externally, we wanted to look at kind of broadly what are some industry best practice leaders. Um, what do you think when we're doing external benchmarking, should we stick to our industry or look broader? Yeah, yeah, it's good to do both, right? What's the advantage of focusing on your own industry? Relatable. Yeah, it's relatable, right? People kind of trust that, okay, if another utility is using it or another you know, municipality is using it, it could probably work here, right? So the trust factor goes up a little bit. What's the drawback to only looking at your own <coughs> industry, though? It's not really insular. Yeah. You're not looking at innovation. innovation, yeah. Absolutely. There could be someone else doing things, some really cool things in a totally different industry that you could borrow from, but we decided not to look at it. So we told the consultants that were helping with us with this, we said, yes, we want you to look at other uh, energy utilities. But don't stop there. We also want to look at some other industries out there that might be doing innovative things around knowledge capture so we can potentially see if we could replicate that here. So they did that for us. Um, we decided to do kind of some benchmarking of what SMUD was doing to others. Surprise, surprise, we came out pretty low because we didn't have much in place <laughs> yet. Uh, but we did get some good ideas of organizations to look at. And really what we're trying to find are what are some existing tools that we could leverage. So one reason I'm happy to get the invitation here is to share some things that we came up with so that it can maybe accelerate your process. So you're not having to kind of recreate the wheel from scratch. So a couple organizations I want to give credit to that uh, were willing to help us. Uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA. Um, they have a fantastic knowledge capture process, um, and they really, I think, set a very high bar for other organizations. Uh, Portland General Electric uh, also was very forthcoming in sharing some knowledge capture interview questions. So um, great organizations to look at as kind of, I would call them best practice leaders. Um, NSA, or NASA has done a lot of knowledge capture, as has World Bank. So if you look at any of those four organizations, and you can Google all this stuff, you'll find a ton of good resources there. So those are some of the uh, existing tools that we wanted to kind of tweak and make, make our own. 
So the second step here of the external was another about four months or so. Um, so altogether, I would say maybe eight, nine months, maybe 10 months for all of this uh, research there. So at the end of all this, they handed us a nice thick report and said, here's a bunch of things you could do or things you should do. Now go do it. And so it was kind of on my lap then to say, okay, how do we tackle putting together something kind of practical that our leaders can use and subject matter experts can use? So one thing that I did is followed up with some of the industry leaders that they were recommending and tried to get a little bit more information about how they were approaching knowledge capture. So the organizations I just mentioned were some of them. Um, we decided that we couldn't tackle this alone. If we wanted it to be a success, we wanted a cross-functional team. So it wasn't just our group and kind of corporate learning and development, but also HR, also some representation from the different business units, um, so kind of a cross-functional team. And we kind of set our sights on how can we design and develop a really useful toolkit. An important step for us was to beta test it. So once we had kind of version 1.0 ready to kick the tires, we took this out to a group of about 15 different supervisors, uh, all from different departments, and said, hey, we're, we have this first version of what we'd like to put out there. Can you give us some feedback on it? We want you to kind of try it out and let us know how it works for you, what can we improve on? And they were very forthcoming with ideas and suggestions. One thing you'll see in our toolkit is a menu of different strategies for development. Version 1.0 did not have that. All it had was an action plan. So that was some of the feedback we got is we want a menu. <laughs> so we're not starting from scratch. So that beta testing for us was really helpful. What, was, what do you suppose another benefit was of involving those 15, 16 supervisors? It goes beyond just giving us feedback on the tool, right? What else does this do for us? Yeah, you buy it. Yeah, absolutely. But at the end of the day, they can go back to their work groups and say, hey, I'm trying this new thing. It's pretty cool. You know, it's got a couple bugs in it, but I think it could really serve us. And when they come out with version 2.0, I think this is going to be a really good, really good thing for our group. So for us, it helped us get some early champions behind it. And that was important for us. All right, so pre-briefings. So we decided that we wanted to get support from executives. So how many of you have done an executive presentation before? Anyone been there? So you probably know that if it's the first time they're seeing it, that's a problem, right? <laughs> so I'm guessing, have you done pre-briefings then before these? Kind of get them ready? Yeah. Yes. So that's kind of standard practice in many organizations is you never want the first time they see what you're offering to be in that meeting with all their peers. If you have someone who really hates it, someone who has concerns, objections, you want to hear about that well before the official meeting. So we had about six or seven of these one-on-one -on -one meetings to try to kind of pre-sell what we had to offer for the, to the organization. And every time we heard an objection, if we didn't have an immediate answer, we had to come back with a good answer. And in some cases, we made some adjustments to what we were doing and proposing based on those pre-briefings. So the HR manager, the chief workforce officer, some of the other key executives that we knew would be influential in whether or not this would be adopted uh, company-wide. We then actually did a formal presentation to executives. We outlined the business case in terms of why is this important now. What do you suppose some of the data is that we use to make that business case? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> first slide, that's it. Yeah, all the data about, hey, we've got an aging workforce. Look at how many leaders are about to retire, right? Look at how many one-person job classifications we have. So all that data you get out of HR really helps you with building a good business case. Um, we also looked at the fact that some of the industry research that CPS helped us do identified that, you know, we're not alone. So the fact that colleges can't graduate enough power system engineers is a problem, not just for SMUD, it's a problem for everybody. <laughs> so this issue of a very small pipeline of future talent coming into the organization was not at all unique to us. It was really an industry problem. Does anyone else have similar challenges in terms of the pipeline for talent? Right? In terms of just kind of thinking about where these people are going to come from? Right? That's a real, what are some examples where you have an issue of kind of a small or shrinking pipeline of future people to fill some critical jobs. Great example, great example. Any other examples where you know there's gonna be a shortage? It's gonna be hard to find these people? Great, great example. And oftentimes we're lacking you know, good training programs to kind of get these people skilled up or kind of educate them so they can hit the ground running. So I think for power system uh, engineers, for example, um, 
all of the graduates from, Sac State has one of the programs, so luckily they're in our backyard. Um, all of those graduates for that, from that one program cannot meet the needs of just PG&E, let alone <laughs> all the other uh, power utilities out there. So a huge shortage in terms of that pipeline. So that was part of our business case. Hey, look, we're gonna have a real critical point here where we can't find these skills. We're gonna have to kind of develop them in-house, some of them. But we can't do that unless we're capturing this knowledge. So that was all part of our, our business case. We put together a proposed process, which I'll share with you in a moment. What can we do about it? And then we made it very clear, okay, for each of the leaders in that room, here's what kind of support we're looking for. What do you suppose we ask for in terms of support from those senior leaders? What could help this be a success? Absolutely. How many of you think that the odds of someone actually participating increase when their boss says this is important, right? <laughs> As opposed to someone from corporate saying, yeah, you should do it. So usually that really brings it up in terms of level of priority. So if people are already super busy and you come to them saying, hey, I think you should go through this knowledge capture process, it'll require about six to 10 hours of your time. What are the odds they're gonna say, sorry, too busy, right? That happens all the time unless the message is coming from not just their boss, but their boss's boss. In some cases, it would be coming from their boss's boss's boss, saying, look, this is important, this is coming. We expect all of you to participate. We expect you to give us 100%. This is a priority for our business unit. So when this comes to you, fully support it because I expect you to. That's a very different message when it comes from their leadership rather than from someone outside their organization. So company-wide rollout. We had a memo come out from the chief workforce officer we met with each business unit leadership team and we asked them to identify who are the people that we should really focus on, who's most at risk for knowledge loss. So I'm gonna show you in a moment the toolkit and some of the ways we assess that risk. So we'll get to some of the detail in a moment. But we thought it was important that we actually meet face to face with the leadership team. So this would be the executive uh, managers and some of the suits in each of those areas to identify where should we start. This could be a little bit like, you know, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. So <laughs> that was kind of our approach here is to say, look, you can have a lot of different needs in your area. We want to just start with a few critical needs. We're going to walk you through a process to identify the most at-risk individuals. So that was important. We captured all that data in the meeting. We didn't ask them to send us anything back because we knew the odds of getting it back were slim. So in the meeting, we actually used a hard copy template, captured all that data, sent it back and said, tell us if anything is wrong here because we're about to follow up with all these needs. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I have a uh, question and stuff like basically, you know, your individuals that, um, you know, have the knowledge, you know, they have the experience. One thing that I'm seeing is um, you have several, you know, like a lot of individuals that I'm seeing, their approach is like bullet points. They right. get right to the fact. Yes. You know, they know the system yeah. or that process, they get right to the fact. How did you guys, or, you know, how, how, what was your approach on? breaking that knowledge down to where yeah. it was stuck. Yeah, so that's a huge challenge, and we face that exact same issue. When we get to the actual uh, strategies, uh, when we get there, one of the, I'm gonna talk about five or six today. One of them is the knowledge capture interview. And that particular interview template we put together is important because, to your point, if the first question you ask is, well, tell me how you do this, right? To your point, they might just give me four, five, six bullets <laughs> and stop there. So we wanted a little bit more rigorous process to then ask a lot of follow-up questions. Well, tell me more about how you do it, right? Where do you start, where do you end? What are the most challenging steps? Um, if you won the lottery tomorrow and you wanted this organization to be successful and you were gone, what are the few things you would want someone to know about your job? What are the things that you found most painful to learn when you first started out? We have a list of probably 30, 40 of these types of questions to really dig and go beyond just the initial few bullet points that they give us. Uh, so usually when we go through those interviews, the best case scenario, you have an interviewer, they're only focused on the interview and the follow-up questions, and then you have a note taker. Now I've done both. I've tried to take notes while interviewing. It's very difficult to do. Because what happens inevitably is you miss a good opportunity to ask a good probing question. So it's ideal if you can actually have three people in the room to really dig into that. So I definitely know what you're talking about, and for us, it helped having a set of standard questions 
that we would typically ask to really dig into what they do. Okay. Um, any other comments on this piece? So we thought uh, at the local level, let's develop some champions to help us out. So in each business unit, we went back partially to some of the supervisors that helped us beta test it. And then also we put out the word more broadly, okay, who else can help us with this because we can't do it alone. If it's just coming from us and it's kind of coming from the outside in, we thought that would be more challenging than it coming from the inside. Um, so that was kind of our goal there. So we actually worked, sat them down for about a three hour training, walked them through the toolkit, and then they could go back out and use it in their business unit. So I know that was kind of a high level overview on the different steps here. I'm gonna dig in to the toolkit in just a moment. But I wanted to start by giving you this bigger picture view of all the different steps. It went way beyond just a tool. There was a lot of thought that went into how do we approach this in a way so we can get adoption. Because we figured if we just threw a tool at people, the odds of them using it were pretty slim to none. So we thought, let's really be careful about who we involve, how we involve them, get some early participation, and try to get some people excited about this before it officially rolls out. So as of the official launch date, probably 50, 60 people had seen it or touched it before it officially launched. So there was already a lot of kind of word on the street, so to speak, before it actually uh, version two launched. Any questions on that? All right. So we decided to also provide some open enrollment training. So I'm going to talk more about this in a moment. We thought we should have a two-pronged approach. One is these leaders saying, here's who we should focus on in my organization. I know, I, you know it's keeping me awake at night because these are some real subject matter experts that I know it's going to be painful if we lose them. And then we also offer these open enrollment trainings so that if any individual sees a need and their boss isn't doing anything about it, we don't have to wait around. <laughs> Sign up for the training. We offer them twice a year, two, three times a year. Um, and we'll walk you through the process. And that way, anybody who's concerned about maybe leaving a good legacy, making sure their teammates are left in a good spot when they go, they can go through this process as well. Questions or comments on anything we've talked about so far? I promise to stop yakking soon and get into the workshop mode. All right, so here's the two prongs, management-driven and employee-driven. If we had only gone with the right-hand side and said, here are some workshops, come one, come one, come all, that are interested, what's the risk to only trying bottom-up? Could that be risky? Why could that be risky if we only rely on it being employee-driven? Come check out this workshop. We have this cool tool we want you to try. People won't have the time and the authorization to, to follow through. And I yeah. think it's a great idea. Absolutely. I might think, yeah, this sounds interesting. It sounds cool, but my boss won't support it, so <laughs> can't go. That's one issue. What's another challenge if we only make this bottom-up employee-driven? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's possible you have someone there that their boss would be very nervous about sharing whatever it is they plan to share <laughs> with others, right? Yeah, maybe they're not a role model for how to do this particular task. So yeah, that's, that's another problem. If we had only tried top down, that's also problematic, isn't it? Right? Because then it's always, well, you, you're telling me to do this. And it, as soon as we tell people they need to do it, what do we usually get? Robots. Yeah, robots, resistance, right? You know, who are you to tell me, right? So there's a risk of just relying on either one approach. So we decided to try both. And that way we're, we end up capturing kind of a mix. Normally in these workshops, the open enrollment, we announce the date, we announce the time, come for about three, three four hours. Um, we get a mix in those. We get some supervisors showing up that know they have a couple people in their group that they're definitely nervous about leaving. Maybe they're worried about them being headhunted, they're worried about them retiring, whatever that concern is. They're, they're just, it's keeping them awake at night. And then we also have about the other half that shows up at these is individuals. They're the subject matter expert, and they want to leave a good legacy when they move on, right? Whether it's retirement or something else that's causing them. So we decided to try a little bit of both. <coughs> so I mentioned this earlier. We met with these senior leaders to identify who's most at risk. And then we followed up with them to go through the toolkit. And that's usually about two or three meetings. So the question usually would come up, how long does this take? <coughs> usually the toolkit is at least two two-hour meetings. Sometimes there's a third two-hour meeting, just depending on how much information we get there. I mentioned those half-day workshops. We talked about barriers to knowledge capture. We talked a little bit about that. 
in your organizations, what are some of the barriers to knowledge capture? What can get in the way? A lot of people know it's a problem, but sometimes it's hard to do anything about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just get it just drops off. Yeah. Anyone else relate to this one? All right. Just not enough time. What else? <laughs> just to say, like, uh, lack of maybe experience of organizing this this kind of knowledge and or, yeah. or formatting it even. A lot yeah. of times, just I've never had to. Usually, we get our task kind of taught to us, handed to us. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. So lack of experience, kind of organizing all this information. Absolutely. Um, what else might be a barrier to knowledge capture in your organizations here, and then we'll come back here. Someone actually, you know, in charge of doing something like this. Right. Program person. Okay. So would this be someone in charge of the actual knowledge capture effort? Yeah. Because, yeah. 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 We experienced the same challenge around workforce planning. There was a time when our HR group would hand a template, a blank template, to the business leaders and say, okay, create your workforce plan. How many of those do you think got created? <laughs> Without any follow-up? None, right? So the new process we have is there's a meeting with all the executives, then there's a meeting with the directors, and it cascades down to plans at the supervisor manager level. So it's, stru it's very structured and there's a ton of follow-up with our business partners kind of leading that effort. So another hand back here. Uh, sometimes the SMEs are the most experienced operators, just aren't the trainers. Good point, yeah, yeah. Anyone else face that challenge where the expert is not a good trader? Right? That's, a, that's a pretty big one. And for that reason, we, when we're doing our knowledge capture process, we often will couch it as, hey, we want to better understand your job, your role, kind of how, what makes you successful. We, we rarely tell them we're planning on making them a trainer. But typically what we say is we just want to kind of document a lot of this stuff so that someone at the organization can find a way to share that with others, whether it's a job aid, a checklist, maybe it is training, right? But um, well, this can scare people away as well, right? <laughs> you say, okay, now stand in front of a group of 20 or 30 of your peers and teach it. That can be a really tall order. Yeah? Did you guys figure out a way to assess, okay, if you remove 30% of the people that were going to retire mm. and you lose their knowledge, did you assess the people you had? Mm. And now you guys have been doing this for six years. Where are you now? Right. Did you guys yeah. figure out a way to do that? So that's still a challenge for, for us. So we knew at a high level here's the, the risk of not executing, but we haven't kind of collected a lot of data on the actual impact of that, where, where they didn't follow through maybe on their plan. Yeah, that's a, that's a real challenge. I just thought it happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Yes? We have a changing industry. Yeah. Changes year to year, bringing in new things. So our um, information changes and our experts change and so it's a constant update and a constant ability to be vigilant about what we're doing. Absolutely. So a very fluid environment, a lot of changing expectations, changing jobs, right? That can be a pose a challenge. Let us all hand in the back. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the barriers to knowledge capture is the fact that knowledge is, is power and some people are reluctant to let go of that power that they, they acquired through knowledge. I think you raise an excellent point. Can anyone imagine the subject matter expert holding on to what they've got? Because in a sense, it kind of makes them valuable, doesn't it? I mean, it feels good to be the go-to person. Right? Who doesn't want to be that person? <laughs> if you're always being asked to put on the cape and save the day, right? If I share that, suddenly I'm less valuable, right? What if I don't have the cape anymore? <laughs> what if there's three people that can wear that cape? So yeah, that's a, that's a real problem. Did I miss someone else in the back? All right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So this method to store, and, and for us, the the tool that we've been kind of making our default is SharePoint to make sure it's searchable by others. Uh, usually, it's <coughs> the Word document to capture the interview. And then if it, we do get a process map or we get a checklist, we'll put that out there as well. 
Uh, but that's important. It doesn't just sit on a shared drive or sit on someone's hard drive. No one can use that information at that point. So in the workshop, we spend uh, some time talking about <coughs> barriers. We talk about the fact that you know, time is really a reflection of priorities. So if it's important to my boss, if it's important to my boss's boss, it's going to be important to me. And we'll find a way to, to, to make time. And that's why it's important when this rolls out and not just be you know, from the outside in or just bottom up. It needs to also have some management support. Um, and I agree, this, this one is a, a tough one in terms of knowledge equals power. What might you say to a subject matter expert who has that mindset? Knowledge is power. You want them to participate in this process. You know they're going to be holding back. What could you say to them to kind of help motivate them? You can let them know the importance of you know, yeah. their knowledge you know, to where uh, it's needed. Yeah, absolutely. So here's the value of sharing this knowledge, right? And is it possible that people actually gain <coughs> credibility the more they share that know-how? Yeah. And it's a problem as well in terms of just coverage, right? How are your teammates going to do if you're <laughs> sick or on vacation or not ready available, right? So oftentimes, think, getting them thinking about what's the impact of keeping all this to yourself on your teammates, that's a much better message than what this will do for the company, <laughs> right? Or how it aligns with your company values. That's a nice thing to say, but at the end of the day, oftentimes they care a lot more about the people in them, with them side by side in the trenches than just about anyone else, right? So kind of thinking about uh, impact on peers as well as how many of you work with subject matter experts who really would care about leaving a good legacy behind them after working for the organization for a while, right? So if you put in 20, 30 years, right? Legacy matters. So that can be another discussion point. And that's another reason why these, these knowledge capture interviews, when they, when they occur, it's never, the message is never coming from me or someone in my area. It's coming from their boss. And they're sitting down and saying, hey, we want to include you in this process. And here's why I think it's important. And that message needs to come from them, not from someone on the outside who doesn't know what those, those risks are. Yeah. So um, if you have just one subject matter expert, you know, they only have one way to do it at all times. There's never, they never can see any different way or more efficient way or more safer way. It's always the same way at all times. Yeah. A lot of times having other people come in and help you, they can like point things out that maybe we could do it this way, maybe it's better. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Someone might have built a better mousetrap or found a better way to do things. Oftentimes the initial selling point is, look, we know you're very good at this. And we want others to get as good as you are. So help us, right? Help us uh, with, with helping others get there. To your point, another fringe benefit is <laughs> we can find out once this is shared, are people doing it differently? Is this the most efficient way? But that initial message is often, hey, we really want to we value the expertise that you have. Um, so again, we go through all of these different elements there in that, that workshop. I mentioned the mix. All right, so enough about the overall process. We'll get into the uh, toolkit. And again, kind of the planned approach I have is I'll give you a little synopsis of each of the steps in our toolkit here. And then I want to have you working in small groups to think about, is there anything here you can use? Uh, would you change any of the information you're about to see? What else are you doing in these areas? So uh, that's kind of the approach I was going to take. All right, so this is the uh, process we came up with. One thing we decided early on is if we introduced a 16-step process, that was not going to fly. So we really worked hard to simplify, simplify, simplify. The first version of this had five steps. Version two had four. <laughs> version three, we got it down to three. And so that was really important. If you want to explain to someone, you're in the elevator with a manager, and they say, hey, I heard we have this knowledge capture thing. What is it? You have 30 seconds in the elevator. You can't explain a 16-step process in 30 seconds, right? So we really thought about how do we make it simple so that we can explain this in a short amount of time that someone who's interested in it. So we said, there's basically three things you've got to do. Number one, we'll work with you to figure out whose knowledge do we need to capture. We can't capture everyone's knowledge, but we need to really focus on what's the, what are the biggest risks in your organization. Second thing we'll do is identify with that subject matter expert in the room, of all the stuff they know and do, what's the most critical for us to try and capture and share with others. Third thing we'll do is we'll come up with a plan. And the plan is simply who's going to do what by when and what's the status. That's all it is. So that's our 30-second elevator pitch for the Knowledge Capture Toolkit. 